Okay, so we are letting the most interesting talk we have been waiting all day to hear for the end. Uh, Tom Marble has uh, been a contributor to Dejben Java for many, many years now, and uh, we really look forward to hearing about this exciting thing. Oh, thank you, Pablo. So, I, I, you know, I know it's really a hard slot to be kind of the last slot at the end of the day, so I really appreciate you coming out. Um, to hear about Jigsaw and Debian, this is really what uh, I wanted to, uh, to talk to you about. And just to give you a sense of what I want to cover, uh, I want to give you a sense of what I am and what I'm not going to talk about today for, regarding Jigsaw and some of the background that we've actually already covered in terms of uh, jar hell and, and so on and how Jigsaw is hoping to address that. And in particular, what it is about Debian that makes it a really good fit or there's a real good opportunity for us to leverage the work that's being done in up, upstream. And then um, some links and hopefully an opportunity to have further discussion uh, about this uh, and how we, might, how we might use it in the project. So uh, just a little bit about me for background. Um, I've actually got a master's in electrical engineering and that means I like hardware as well as software. Um, and I spent most of my professional life doing software and I uh, spent uh, uh, a little over 10 years working at Sun Microsystems. Initially, I was actually in technical sales, which was a, a strange uh, way to get into Sun, but it was pretty interesting, and I learned a lot from that experience. And as soon as I could, I transitioned into Java R&D and uh, had a position in the Java Performance Group, which was uh, really an eye-opening experience, really, uh, really interesting. One of the things that we did was to automate performance testing for the JVM itself. You heard Stefano talking about automating testing for, for Debian earlier today, and I am a huge fan of that. Um, and then I, you know, I actually started using Debian in around 2003, and uh, in 2006, Sun had realized that uh, uh, Java was not very well integrated on Linux platforms, and uh, decided to do something about it, and so I got involved in relicensing Java uh, for redistribution. So this is only point one of the DFSG, and is obviously non-free, but uh, represented an enormous amount of work within Sun to change the attitude and actually get the legal uh, team on board with relicensing Java. So this was kind of controversial, but it was really the first step on the path to open JDK, which was a uh, fully free implementation of Java. And one of the things that's bringing me back to Java is I'm interested in a couple of different things. One is uh, software transaction um, uh, management, uh, uh, miss, yeah, memory, transactional, software transactional memory, sorry, and for large scale systems. And then also uh, I'm interested in embedded development. And Java seems to be a really good platform for those two things. So what I want to talk about is really just specifically about um, you know, kind of what the goals are for the Jigsaw project and a little bit about it and really focus on what's relevant to Debian or what I think is really appropriate to discuss with Debian. Uh, but, but that's only a part of the story of Jigsaw. I'm not even going to try to uh, cover all of the technical elements of Jigsaw. Uh, it's, uh, it's fairly involved. And I'm also not going to try and talk about OpenJDK in general. But, uh, Modularizing the JDK involves touching many, many parts of the platform. There are language changes, VM changes, class file changes, compiler changes. Um, and uh, Mark Reinhold gave a really excellent talk at Devox, which is linked off of the uh, Jigsaw website, that gives a great overview of uh, the project and uh, some of the approaches that were taken. And in particular, one that I found really interesting was discussing refactoring the JDK and some of the struggles that they had in doing that. Um, as many of you know, the JDK brings along with it a whole bunch of stuff like Corba and XML and all sorts of things that you know, your application might never use, and yet it's, we're stuck with it. And so there's some really good, I'd really recommend that presentation to get some more detail. Another thing that I, I, I could be tempted to talk about, but I'm not going to, are uh, earlier efforts towards modularizing the Java platform uh, notably JSR 277 and related JSRs. And I also don't want to get in too much to the debate about OSGI, although we talked a little bit earlier about how OSGI is really an approach to handling modularity on, uh, above the platform. And the idea of Jigsaw is to actually make it a first class citizen inside the platform. Um, 
All of you know what it's like to be in hell. Uh, jar hell is a particularly nasty flavor of hell. Um, and, you know, in Debian, we've enjoyed being uh, elevated away from hell for a long time. But for Java, unfortunately, it remains. I was actually amazed to find that there's a wiki page that explains jar hell. Uh, but there is. And, you know, just to recap some of the highlights, there's this problem of have, if you have multiple versions of a jar on a class path, you may get some from one or some from the other or a little bit from both. And that, of course, causes uh, a lot of problems. Um, it's quite possible that your dependency graph has a mismatch somewhere where, you know, dependency A requires, you know, C and dependency uh, B requires C prime and C and C prime are conflict and so that, that causes a problem. But the thing that we're most familiar with in trying to package Java is this darn thing about how people s seem to be comfortable sticking binary blobs in their upstream. Uh, and that is, of course, the source of uh, a lot of refactoring trouble. So what is Jigsaw? This is a mercurial forest, uh, which is uh, based off of OpenJDK trunk. So OpenJDK, uh, along with a number of other Sun, uh, now formerly Sun, uh, open source projects chose mercurial as their version control system. And uh, so there is a mercurial forest of Jigsaw that you can get from the OpenJDK website. And the idea is that the JDK is, handles both mod, uh, modules and versions as you can see, so that we never get into the situation where there is ambiguity about which version of a module is being used. And in short, the goal is to get rid of the class path. So the approach that uh, Jigsaw is taking for these requirements is uh, implemented in, in the following features. So um, one, of the, one of the challenges about uh, speed and, and also predictability of which version you're going to get is going to be handled by resolving some of those issues at install time. Uh, using a, a kind of registry system. Uh, feature subsets, as I mentioned, your application may not need all of the APIs that are in the JDKs, so it's n it really doesn't make sense to drag them all along. And multi-module packages will allow you to select just that part of the dependency graph that you actually need. And uh, by the way, the idea is that this will apply not just to the JDK, but also to user applications as well. Um, substitutability, I'm not even sure if that's a word, but I took that word from Mark Reinhold, is this idea of having a virtual module, or you know, what we might say in Debian as it provides. So this is really a completely uncontroversial concept for Debian, but is kind of new for, for Java, as is having optional modules. Um, and the idea of self-applicability is that this actually applies to the JDK itself. So uh, I'm stealing a slide here from Alex Buckley's uh, presentation about Jigsaw. I don't want to go into too much detail about you know, the, the technical implementation of J Jigsaw for the most part. You still have uh, directories like comfu, you know, my uh, compilation unit.java, and organized in a tree. The difference is that you have some magic Java files called module-info.java or package-info.java, which are in your tree that give the metadata that you would otherwise get from, let's say, OSGI. And so what this slide is showing you is a way of handling multiple versions of modules and explains that uh, um, Java C may have its own version of a particular module and it has a, its own resolution system for choosing which one is the right one. And the one they refer, they refer that to that as the magic class path, which is actually inside the running JVM. Um, one of the tricky points, and I'll just make this aside now, about, about leveraging the modular JVM is that the heuristics for the JVM doing this resolution of which, which is the right version may differ from the heuristics of dpackage. So that's something that we will have to, to, uh, to watch carefully. But here's the promise. Right? Today, if you just take OpenJDK 6 uh, you know, on disk, it's 136 megabytes. If I have a Hello World application, I can, you know, just a very simple Hello World application, 425 bytes, I end up with an enormous amount of consumption just to run Hello World. But if I was, I took a stab at, at trying to build Hello World with Jigsaw with just the essential base package, and I'm guessing that it's 30 kilobytes, and I'll, I'll, you'll, it'll become obvious later why I don't have the exact answer here. But the idea is that you know, we can cut down our on-disk space and in-memory space significantly. In fact, performance is a huge 
huge motivation for Jigsaw. So the, the whole idea, and I have to give a lot of credit to Upstream because they, they have looked at Debian as an example of why this packaging or this modularity would, would uh, be applicable and how it would integrate with an operating system. Um, and their idea is very deliberately that there would be a one-to-one -one mapping between Java jigsaw modules and Debian packages. Um, so you have this sort of idea, and this is what the kind of uh, syntax that you might see within a module-info.java file is. Uh, my module with a particular version provides a virtual provides a particular version and has a certain number of depends, or as they say, requires. Um, there are other constructs that are in the uh, description of a module. There's one that I, I, I understand why they did it, but I think it will be really difficult to, to map that carefully into Debian, and that's this idea of a permits statement. And the idea of permits is that they're basically saying that um, my module will only permit the specified set of modules to depend upon it. It's as if it's controlling who can have an R depends on it. And um, the idea is that that way you could conceivably have a secret module somewhere. Uh, and th that concept doesn't map particularly well into uh, Debian. But I just thought I would mention it. So this is obviously a, a complete abuse of trying to map Jigsaw to Debian. So I, I just picked one Java application at random, which is FreeMind. Um, and at the bottom, you see some excerpts from the control file. And at the top, I tried to put in, you know, sort of roughly what you might see in a Jigsaw module declaration. Um, obviously, there's, there's, a, there's a couple of things that you notice right away. Um, in, in Debian, there are a lot of different expressive ways that you can talk about version relationships. We had a really good discussion earlier about what does it mean to have backwards compatibility. And again, one of the great things about Debian is that Debian packages have a version string, and it's very well defined. And you can do a compare on two version strings and find out which one is later. And my understanding from Jigsaw is that they're kind of leaving that version string to be completely free format, which means that comparison is going to be very difficult. And you know, understanding what, what's compatible or expressing the kinds of things that you can express in these operators here might be very difficult. That being said, I think that there's, there's something to build on. And I, this is just one way of highlighting the mapping between Jigsaw and Debian. So one of the things that comes up a lot with Upstream in particular is Deploying a solution is, or deploying new functionality in the Java platform is rarely done, or is it, well, isn't done, unless it can be done in a cross-platform way. And this is where Debian has a really, I think, unique opportunity to leverage this work of modularizing the JVM. There's all these benefits that we talked about for modularization, but if you think about it, there are very, very few operating systems that can actually do this right. Debian obviously has all of the infrastructure to handle this and do it really well. Um, other GNU Linux systems could do this. Um, Ubuntu obviously could inherit this very easily. Um, Fedora probably could as well, although as I mentioned, there will probably be some fuzz as any of you who have tried to harmonize the Fedora dependency graph with the De Debian dependency graph. It's not exactly a one-to-one -one mapping. So there's a little bit of fuzz. I don't know a lot about BSD. I know that there are various approaches to packaging in the BSD world. Um, so there, that might be possible. Uh, I just, had, I, just, I just met uh, someone interesting uh, the other day from uh, Nexenta who pointed out to me that there is going to be an announcement tomorrow that might have an impact on people that are passionate about Open Solaris. I don't know anything about it. I don't know what it means. If you want to know more, go to alumos.org and get the, uh, the announcement of that. Um, obviously, Open Solar or Solaris historically has suffered from a horrible System 5 packaging system. And there's a new packaging system called IPS, which is hopefully a little bit better. And if those of you have seen something like Nexenta, which really leverages Debian packaging, you see how much even better that is. But there's an opportunity for Jigsaw to work with that. I don't know a lot about Mac OS development, but my experience with it is it's kind of wonky, and I think it'll be... There isn't really this... There isn't really the, the discipline of decomposition and interdependency that we have in the Debian world. And of course, Windows is completely a nightmare. As there's no infrastructure for handling this, and it would have to be almost developed from scratch. So for that reason, Debian is uniquely qualified, I think, to handle, to handle uh, modularity in the Java platform. So one of the neat things that, that uh, Upstream did is they created this, this uh, program called JPackage. 
And it's really nifty. It's sort of like, um, it, you know, it's sort of like Java Helper, if you could imagine that being upstream. And what it does is it takes all of your, all of your Java class files and it does something magic. And out at the end, you get binary devs. What? Yeah, right. I mean, it's really cool. You know, um, except there's a couple of little problems, which I'll get into in the next slide. Um, one of the things that I appreciate is that they included a, a demonstration of how this works, and I, I wanted to highlight the path for you because you might not you might not stumble across this in, in the tree in the source tree for for Jigsaw. Um, it says it's it's in this directory that says Solaris, but then in the make file down below it says this will only work on a Debian system, which is I think pretty pretty funny. Um, but you run, I didn't actually do this because you look at the code and you run make and it runs the shell script which ends up doing a bunch of uh, depackage installations and removals and some other things that are, you know, you might feel a little bit uncomfortable trying to do on your live system. I actually tried to do that in a Cheroot and um, had some trouble with that as well. And right here you'll see why. I went to install uh, the base module from Jigsaw on my shiny new Debian Cheroot and you'll find out that just something trivial the version number doesn't comply with Debian policy. And so that makes our tools barf, and we can't install it, um, which is really a shame. Um, and I think that the, their idea, and I, you know, Mark says in his talk, that they wanted to be very flexible about version strings. But the trouble is, we can't be flexible about version strings without breaking Debian. So we have to, we have to handle that problem. And of course, the one that I knew was going to be a problem is all the other parts of Debian policy. I couldn't even run Lintian correctly because of the, the version string thing, but already, you know, you see there's a whole bunch, and this is just one of many packages. So there's a lot of stuff to do to get, if we want to get this uh, packaged correctly. So you know, what's neat about what Jigsaw has done is it's broken the JDK up into 126 different devs. Um, and that's really neat, and here I've, from Mark's presentation, I've stolen a, a graph. I actually created an actual dot file from, for GraphViz of the 126 packages, but I knew it wouldn't be visible at the resolution on this screen. And maybe I'll do that in SVG and publish that so you can play around with it. But um, Here you can see big chunks of functionality that uh, all show you big sort of clusters of functionality in Jigsaw so that if you really only need the base module, you don't have to get all this other junk. Or if you're doing just a GUI client, you don't need all of this other junk, and which, is, which is really, really nice. Um, and here, I don't know exactly what precedent there is in Debian for having a source package produce 126 or more binary packages, but I'm guessing this might be a little bit awkward and we might need to think carefully about how to do it. It should just work. Should just work? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, that, that's what I love about Debian is stuff just works. Um, so why do you want Jigsaw? Well, part of it is smaller download size, smaller size on disk, obviously smaller memory footprint, and because of that, you get faster startup time. Uh, most importantly is that we'll get you know, module versioning that matches Debian, and hopefully have a basis for solving jar hell in all of our upstream packages that we're, we're packaging. So there's a lot of reasons why it would be nice, but I realized when I was sort of talking to people about this and thinking about it, that this is actually part of a larger issue that I want to bring to your attention, and that is, what do we do about Java, free Java, and Debian going forward? A long time has has you know has gone since you know JDK six came out, JDK seven hasn't come out, and I'd like to speculate just a little bit about what is the future of upstream because I think it might have a bearing on what we decide to do. Um, You'll notice, for those of you that have been following the Java community process, that there isn't a Platform 7 JSR, which is kind of the uh, upstream approach to deciding what is JDK 7. And this is due to the longstanding, among other things, probably the longstanding de debate between the Apache Software Foundation and, and formerly Sun about uh, the field of use restriction in, uh, in Java. And as a result, the JCP has basically been stalled. And so the question uh, that I think we all can ask is, what does it mean for Sun Java 7? Or what, what can we make any reasonable prediction about a release and make any release kind of decisions around that? And um, I think that it's very hard to know. I've pressed my friends at Oracle a lot for answers to this on and off the record. And they basically can't tell me anything. 
So I don't know what we can infer from that. I know a lot of work has gone into this. You'll see on the, on the OpenJDK website, there's a whole calendar of milestones that has been followed. Um, but that calendar of milestones doesn't list any milestones after September of this year. So I don't know if that means that they would plan to release at that time or if they'll make more milestones or what will happen. That being said, a lot of cool development has gone into uh, JDK 7 Alpha, if you will, into Upstream. And I think that Debian is in a position to consider packaging that. Um, there are a lot of features that are in JDK 7, and I put a link here uh, in the slides, and I'll, I'll share the slides. A um, couple of things that I really want to call out to your attention. One is Jigsaw, one is the modularity. Another one is uh, tail recursion is supported natively. And this is potentially a huge, huge performance benefit. So the, just to give you a sense of this, um, if you have uh, function A that calls function B and function B that calls function C, every time you change that context, you've got to push things under the stack, change, change your context, and go to the new function. And the idea of tail calls or tail recursion is that you can basically push things uh, uh, in such a way that you basically transition from A to B so that when C finishes, it returns directly to A. So if you have a, a recursive function, you're not going to pay this huge penalty of bloating the stack with a bunch of return values that basically are sitting there that you don't really need all that stuff on the stack. It all collapses at the end when the final call is done. So um, I'll explain why that could be pretty interesting in a, in a second. Lambda expressions, anonymous functions are supported in, in uh, OpenJDK 7. There's the invoke dynamic bytecode, which uh, has been shown to have some huge benefits for interpreted languages like JRuby and Jython. Uh, that, that's related to that you can uh, garbage collect uh, <laughs> dynamic classes, or that's separate? Um, I think that it's separate. Uh, did that made it to JDK 7, or? Invoke dynamic, yes. Uh, no, the garbage collection of dynamically created classes? Um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know I'll the question check the there. Uh, another, another thing is some of you may, may recall from uh, Java 5, one of the things that was a big addition there was the concurrency utilities from Doug Lee, which was JSR 166. And there's some new extensions to that in JDK 7 uh, called fork join, which is just this idea that you can create kind of a pool of sub-processes and then collect the results later. So in terms of di a different metaphor or, or tool for parallelism, that could be a good one. And so as we get into obviously more and more multi-core and multi-CPU systems, doing concurrency I think is going to be really important. So what are the applications of modularity? Well, um, uh, obviously one of the ways that we could use this is, uh, or use uh, JDK 7 in general is to support all of the new features, but it's specifically for uh, modularity, I think it could be very helpful for um, uh, things like mobile and embedded where you really need to have a small footprint and you need to have short startup time. And some of the other performance related features could be really important for other JVM based languages like uh, Clojure and JRuby and Jython and so on. And in, in fact, um, one of the things that I mentioned about uh, my interest here is Clojure in particular because, you know, I, I like, you know, working in a Lisp dialect probably even better than I work, like working in, in the Java programming language. Um, and Clojure is a really interesting take on this. It's based on the JVM, and it has a lot of uh, idioms for concurrent programming and immutability and so on, and it is getting a lot of attention as a software transactional memory uh, architecture. So for high-performance systems, I think it's a really interesting thing, and wouldn't it be great if we could build Clojure to take advantage of tail calls and fork join, um, and we could do that within Debian. And before all of the committees necessarily settle down and decide exactly you know, how they want to standardize that. Um, on the JVM Language Summit uh, wiki, there is a list of uh, requests to upstream for improving the JVM, and Rich Hickey, who's the author of Clojure, has a number of things that he wants out of the JVM, some of which have been done, some of which have been worked on, some of which haven't been started yet. One of the things that I'd love to do is I'd, like to, I'd, I'd love to have something like a shebang, like uh, bin OJC, where O is open JDK, uh, J is Jigsaw and C is Clojure, where we could have, let's say, a Clojure script in a text file and have the startup time not be completely miserable and have it handle things like standard out and centered, centered in right. I mean, it's possible that we could do that and have that be, you know, a, a reasonable way of doing quick Clojure programming. 
So I mentioned a little bit about performance. A lot of the promise of Jigsaw has to do with performance. And, you know, one of the things that I've learned in my travels is that, especially with the JVM, it's really important to measure the impact and performance as opposed to just rely on your assumptions. The JVM is really a remarkable piece of uh, machinery and does some very, very clever optimizations that it's very difficult to predict how it will behave uh, without actually trying it. Um, and so one of the things that I think this drives my interest in, and I'm just mentioning this, is into uh, performance analysis tools to help measure the impact of these different changes. So, and this is another sort of take on Stefano's, I think, call for more automation. Um, there are like these four different kinds of things that we would want, and I haven't actually looked through the archive to see how much of this um, would be useful, in, especially in Java, but, you know, we need a benchmark harness that actually runs benchmarks, collects statistics, and so on. Obviously, benchmarks themselves that hopefully represent a, a workload that is, that is meaningful. It's actually very difficult to write a benchmark for the Java platform that does what you think it does because the uh, JVM is doing so much optimization um, that uh, you think that you write a loop inside a loop inside a loop, and actually the JVM unrolls the whole thing and de declares it dead. It doesn't have to execute anything. Um, so benchmarks are, are important. Um, then once we get the data, aggregating it, storing it in a database of some form is uh, important and figuring out a way to share it. And then also visualization, obviously comparing the things that are comparable and being able to draw meaningful conclusions from statistics is, is really important. One of the things that we did at Sun was leveraged uh, pr a pretty high discipline of statistics uh, and specifically the student's t-test before we would actually make a determination that some code change had a meaningful performance impact. So what's next? Or, you know, this is, uh, you know, as they used to say in Shot of Jack, just the beginning of the conversation. Um, so we could consider uh, Jigsaw as part of our Java policy discussions. I think it's, it's worth thinking of the pros and cons of what it would mean and in the large kind of what it what it might mean to support OpenJDK 7, even though Upstream hasn't formally released uh, OpenJDK 7 yet. And uh, I have some links here for the Jigsaw project and also uh, the recent JVM Language Summit that has some really good slides from a notable uh, Java uh, engineers throughout the industry that you know, I think you'd be interested in to see the kind of work that's going on uh, in Upstream. So with that, are there any questions? So on the, the J package stuff that you'd mentioned earlier, um, the, I'm, I, I, w I would tend to shy away from those sorts of tools, um, mostly because they have a tendency to reinvent a bunch of things that are in Debian, but they do usually, be, if Upstream is doing it, they do it in a fairly static way. Um, unfortunately, a lot of Upstreams have a lot of experience with RPM packaging, where the RPM, for the most part, RPM packages and how they're done mostly don't change. Um, they haven't really changed that substantially in quite some time. So they, they treat it as something where, okay, so I, I generated an RPM, RPM installs, I'm good, and I move on to the next project and look at something else. Um, Debian packages actually change a lot. And so anything that's not using something like Deb Helper um, at the bottom level to do the actual package assembly has a tendency to break when policy changes. Um, and I don't know how they put all that together. Um, but for example, the, the bit there where they're using um, sudo dpackage-i to kind of to, to build an environment, they're sort of reinventing well, that, that cow dancer. To, that was just to do that was just to do a particular uh, demonstration, but it's the kind of thing that you you would not want to just start that script and let it rip because right. you'd be very uncomfortable with that. Yeah, I mean, if if we can encourage them to, you know, it, what 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 helps a lot is if 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 they uh, if we can sort of work with them to provide, um, you know, here's a Debian directory, and then we can patch that Debian directory. They've got a Debian directory that they can sort of just run Debian rules build on, and then, but we can contribute back, you know, here's the changes you need for the next version of policy for the next thing that's changed. I actually think that they would really welcome these kinds of proposals, you know, just say, you know, gently that, you know, your version string actually does matter, you know, we, we, we can't have underscores in it. Um, and uh, also, the. You're absolutely right. I mean, absolutely, you know, because Debian policy is going to evolve. And one of the things I want to call to your attention here is that they have, they have a lot of module names that are of the variety JDK.base or JDK.boot or, you know, those sorts of things. Um, and then that becomes the lead part of the Debian package name using the JPackage tool. Mm -hmm. Well, 
We probably don't want to do that. I'm guessing we might want to prefix this with something like jigsaw-7-module or you know, something like that. The jigsaw language? Right. Or you know, look, maybe looking at X, the way XORG does it is a, is a good inspiration for how to, how to handle it. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Yeah. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. 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 During the Debian creation, I think most of this uh, metadata is just written into the JAR manifest, or what does the tools do? Uh, you mean, uh, you're talking about the... the I, can, I probably can use Jigsaw without Debian, so uh, it spreads the data somewhere into the JAR yeah, file. Yeah, so, so it becomes, the module-info Java turns into a module-info.class, and that just becomes part of the JAR. Oh, okay. and then, but, but, it, but it's a good point, because... Because obviously the class loader and the VM have to be smart to know that, to know that they're dealing with a jigsaw module system and to read that class and then to you know, behave appropriately. Okay. So what do people think? Does it, uh, do, you, do you like the idea of getting some of the new JDK 7 features, including modularity, or is it biting off way too much? Hell yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I was hearing what you were mentioning that uh, JDK 7 is a little bit in the limbo. That sounds a little scary. Well, it is a little scary. Um, but, you know, I think that I, I, wish we could get, I wish we could get Oracle to make a definitive statement about, you know, you know this is what we're going to do and this is when we're going to do it. But in a lot of ways, because of the Java community process, they can't unilaterally make that decision anyway. So they could express their intent of, well, we plan to go to the JCP and propose a Platform 7 JSR. Um, but I actually wouldn't expect them to make that kind of declaration either. So uh, we kind of have to view this as a little bit of a risky uh, you know, upstream trunk that is a moving target. And um, as I mentioned, there are some, if, we, if we go down this path, there are some subtleties like the way that uh, the Jigsaw VM resolves dependencies versus the way dpackage does, and we'll have to, we'll probably end up tripping over some weird bugs as a result of that. Um, but there might be some really interesting upside in, uh, in doing it too, so it might be worth giving it a shot. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I was speaking the other day with uh, uh, Matthias about the issue that you bring up, Pablo, which is um, all the different architectures and, and so on, and one of the challenges that we have is that um, the uh, the hotspot compiler doesn't build on some of the, some of the uh, minor architectures. And so, you know, one of the questions is, is it good enough to have a JIT on those architectures? You know, how violently would people complain as opposed to using GCJ? Um, that's one of, the, one of the questions that we'll have to ask. Uh, as someone who knows very little about Java because of all the disconnects that we've been talking about and you just sort of go, oh, I can't be bothered, I'll disinstall it again. Uh, <laughs> this description makes it sound very tempting because you can just install a little bit of it and I, the, if we were to package the version 7 stuff what do you think the chances in 10 years time that uh, Debian will be upstream for Java? <laughs> well I, I think it's a really interesting question and you don't even have to qualify it with the 10 years time uh, because uh, the, the, the challenge is that the other operating systems simply can't do what Debian does very easily, especially, especially Windows. So if we are, figure out how to crack this nut and answer all the issues that everybody brought up today, Matthew and Torsten and Pablo and Nielsen, we figure out a way of solving these basic issues and then we can do the modularity right in a clean way, we will absolutely be the upstream. Because, Jeff? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just kind of... Well, really say plus one. I recently changed jobs and I have to work with some CLR nuts and they give me all kinds of grief about Java's completely stagnant. Um, it's falling behind it. I mean, during your presentation here, I'm thinking, wow, you know, we get this into experimental. We may actually start attracting developers just to Debian, to just the distribution itself because we have it and no one else does. Right. And just imagine if we actually get closure to work with fork join and tail recursion on, you know, God knows a 64-way system, and it totally rocks over you know what you get out of the box. That might cause people to say, "Wow, what is this Debian thing? I think I want that." Yeah, 
And, and then just a, just a question, I guess maybe for the for you in the room at large. Then is what what kind of risks do we see? Um, I mean, I I understand we'd be building off the upstream trunk. It's not actually really released yet. Um, would we be perceived perhaps as the group that you know if they change direction radically, then um, they see it that Debian waffled on this whole thing? Or I, I'm just curious. I don't know. I think that there's a much more practical concern, which is that. This is really complicated stuff, and I don't want to minimize the fact that there are changes in the VM and the class order and the files and all this, and I, c I don't claim to understand it. I mean, I know some of the engineers that, that work at Oracle that are super smart that have spent a long time working on this, and um, the, the risk that we run, especially if we become the upstream, is that then we need to maintain uh, kind of the inner, inner workings of it, which is a pretty tall order. Um, you know, and maybe, you know, so I think it's, I think it's, it's tempting, but it, it would be a huge challenge, too. I mean, the reward that I see is that one of the things that we five have to fight all the time is people who don't feel like Debian is a viable platform for doing, high, you know, heavy Java development. I think that's something that we've had out there for a while because of the Sun Java not being in the archive for a while and, um, so, and just that perception that's built up. And this, I mean, the reward that I see here is we could reverse that overnight. I mean, if, if Debian is the one that embraces what becomes OpenJDK 7 and really understands how to do the packaging properly and solves the dependency problem, which is, I mean, there's a bit of a fight. Uh, you, you have to convince a lot of Java developers that they have a dependency problem because they just ship WAR files. But I think that if you can convince them that, of that and, and kind of point, and having a working system that it really does it right is a great way of showing what you can do when you've got a full functioning dependency system that we could, it, it could leapfrog, basically. Uh, right. I mean, it's a lot of work, and that's the question is, can we find the people who can do this stuff and get them to work in Debian? Well, and maybe if we can take what Nielsen and Matthew were talking about of automating things and building more into Java Helper, you know, maybe we can reduce our cost of bringing stuff into the correct level of dependency stuff and really show that, you know, it's a best practice kind of environment and, and get to that that level that you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, because we're, we're, I mean, I know at Stanford we're facing, we've got a bunch of five applications in Java that we're taking over from another group, and we're looking at, you know, basically a bunch of war files and, you know, 47 copies of one particular internal Stanford jar in, you know, 20 different versions. And, I, you know, this is what the package manager solves for you. And if you can introduce that concept into the Java community and show them how it works, I mean, that would be huge. And, and I love Java. As a, it's, I've, I've talked to so many people who say, I love Java as a language. Java is a great language. Um, the deployment mechanism from a system administration perspective is horrible. And I, you know, because it doesn't work with that kind of level of tool and you have these war files over the place, they're opaque, and then you get a security vulnerability in one of your dependency jars. And, you know, and, and, and this could resolve, to me, the biggest issue that everyone faces with Java. Well, and you're sitting at Stanford and you look at this 47 different copies of the same thing and you're saying, there's a better way. Exactly, yeah. And, you know, and it, this is stuff that's already using Maven to do, to do builds. And, and it's just, if we can hook into that system and un, sort of get closer into the way Java developers think about this stuff. I mean, to, to one of the things that was huge I, that happened recently is having Eclipse in Debian, in Debian Unstable, you install it and it works. I mean, wow, that was great. And you know, the more steps we can take down that path, I really do think we have a huge opportunity here to pull a bunch of Mindshare. Because, uh, you know, if you look at the, the stuff that's out on the web, um, or they try to analyze, you know, who's, who, what, people, what are people writing code in, you know, what, what's the most popular languages, what do people talk about, what, where are they, people writing books. Uh, Java's way up there at the top, if not at the top, almost all the time. It's become sort of the, you know, and don't take this wrong, but it's become sort of the, the, the fortran of web programming in the sense that everybody keeps claiming that it's dying or going away, and yet if you look at the actual install base of the code, it is what everyone uses. We, we kind of talked about it as the COBOL. You know, which is a little similar, bit more derogatory. Yes, similar sort of idea. I, I, I come from a more scientific background than a business <laughs> processing background, but yeah, you pick your analogy. I, I actually, you know, I'll admit I really don't like the Java programming language, uh, but I, I have come to appreciate the power of the JVM and what it can do on a multi-threaded, you know, kind of environment and how much work has gone into performance tune that thing. And, you know, I, I might want to do my high-level programming in something like Clojure, but that is going to be based on a really powerful foundation and you know I challenge you to find something better than the JVM to do that um, and you know and even even you know one of the things one of the comments that came out earlier was why not just use GCJ instead of uh, MVM well you know in a number of cases we were seeing and you know some of this data is getting old now that 
dynamically uh, optimized Java outperformed statically compiled Java because of all the clever optimizations that are going on. You pay a little bit of a penalty up front to warm up the hotspot, you know, uh, compiler, but then you get those those the, the, you know that additional benefit back. Um, and the other thing, you know, which is interesting, you hear, you'll hear Keith uh, and B Dale talking about is, you know, if you want to do a cross-platform GUI, um, you know, Java makes that pretty easy. Well, the other thing that is, you know, the huge issue that everybody's talking about right now too is mobile app development. And while some of the mobile platforms are pushing people away from Java, um, some of them are embracing it as the language to do mobile app development in. And if you can prototype on Debian and deploy onto a mobile device, that's a really appealing story to tell people about why they should use Debian, why Debian's interesting. Right, and so for example, what if there were, you know, maybe as a result of the Lenaro project, some really nifty, very powerful handhelds that could run Debian natively and let's say the module system and, you know, have a very powerful result and very low footprint. I mean, that'd be pretty cool. You had a question? Uh, you mentioned the long uh, or extended JCP process and uh, I wonder if, you know, Talking more about the engineering side, has that given the uh, seven line a little more chance to mature? So I wonder what your opinion is on the status uh, of the completeness and or stability of, of seven. That's a great question, and I was trying to answer that question for myself in preparing this talk, and I, I was looking at the, uh, the page on OpenJDK about all the features in JDK 7, and they list some of the things that got descoped and that aren't going to be part of it at the bottom. But for the things that are in flight, you really don't get a sense for how mature they are. I think it's very difficult to know really what the answer to that question is. So um, what I can say is that, that, that Sun, you know, and I presume Oracle now, has had a very, very highly disciplined and methodical release process. And uh, as they get close to a release, they're very thorough about bug triaging. Um, and because there isn't an eminent release, I'm sure that that process hasn't happened yet which would cause features to either get solidified or ejected. So um, that's a little bit of the uncharted territory that we'd be going into. One of, the, one of the sites that would be interesting to reach out to about this is Google, um, because they have extremely heavy Java use inside, um, inside Google, and they're also extremely heavy Ubuntu shop. Um, so there's, I think there's a lot of potential there to, you know, to contact some of the Debian developers inside Ubuntu, or some of the Debian developers inside Google, and ask them if, uh, you know, sort of circ start circulating the idea inside Google and, and see if Google is interested in, you know, in some of these features and if they might be able to volunteer some time of, of uh, Debian folks inside, inside Google or Ubuntu folks inside Google to help make some of this stuff happen. Well, if I was playing devil's advocate, you know, maybe if I was Google, I would look to you and say, well, we've already got the Dolphlik VM, and your idea is really nice, but, you know, show us the working code. I, you know, I don't want to poo-poo that idea. I think you're absolutely right. And, and you know, to the point about, uh, you know, large-scale distributed processing, I mean, who else is doing that kind of scale of, of processing? And if they really are using it internally, then... Um, you'd think that, that, that even, even so, it's not the mobile device, that they might be very interested in it. Well, it's true that a lot of the senior Sun engineers would eventually go to Google. I know many, many of them did. So um, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting thought, and um, yeah, it's a good idea. Um, I had a conversation with a friend of mine at Google a while ago um, who was telling me how much work Google was putting into making GCC better, and I asked him why. Um, just sort of on a business sense, why, why are they doing that? And he said to save electricity. Um, because their operational cost right now, the amortized cost of a machine you know, per year is about equal to the cost of electricity for that machine per year. And so that just kind of got me thinking in general about you know, if there are ways that um, kind of an innovative business case can be made for some of the stuff to, I don't know, just throw something out canonical. You know, is there some economic argument that could be made for that? Um, if people have ideas regarding that business case frame of mind, that might be a little bit weird sounding at first, like, like the electricity thing. Well, but uh, Well, it's not. I mean, I'm actually, you know, one of my other passions is around uh, smart energy and the smart grid, and I think that we could do a lot with free software to save the planet. Um, so I think there's, there's a really great, really great tie-in there. Um, but from a, just a here-today practical business point of view, yeah, if you, do, if you can take some performance optimizations out of running your application, you could save potentially a lot of electricity, a lot of heat, 
um, and ultimately a lot of money by doing those things. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's uh, thank the speaker.